Uh, thanks so much for having me. Um, so invariably, uh, when I uh, talk about this book, people say, uh, Bill Cosby, he's so funny. Are you going to be funny? <laughs> uh, well, I've got to warn you, I'm not a comedian. Um, uh, but I will tell you one of Bill Cosby's favorite jokes. Uh, it takes place uh, at the gates of heaven, the pearly gates, on a day when so many people have arrived that there isn't room for everybody. So St. Peter announces to all these people waiting in line that he's going to have a little contest and that he's going to ask everybody to write down a question for God. And if God cannot answer the question, you'll get in. So one after another, people come up. They write down a question. St. Peter takes it in. He comes back. God has answered the question. I have to go to the back of the line. Finally, uh, an elderly couple who have passed away on the same day come to the front of the line. They write down their question. They give it to St. Peter. He comes back. He says, okay, the two of you are in. And everybody else looks at them and says, well, wait a second. What makes you so special? What did you ask God? And they shrugged, and, and he said, we just asked him when our kids are going to get their act together. <laughs> now, what's interesting about, partic even more interesting about that story is, Bill Cosby told me that joke. He told me that he actually found it on the internet. Um, so even Bill Cosby isn't above sometimes lifting material. Um, but in the original joke, the word was not act together. There was another word, which you can imagine. However, Bill Cosby, who as you know, um, uh, is famous for not only being one of the funniest people on the planet, but having done it all these years without blue humor, decided that he didn't really need the expletive in the joke. It would be just as funny without it. And he took it out. And you know he still gets great laughs uh, with that story. Anyway, um, as Kerry said, you know, I have spent most of my career as a journalist. Uh, I was at Newsweek magazine, and <coughs> then in television at NBC and CNN. Uh, most of that time covering hard news subjects, politics, international relations, business, and so forth. Um, so people ask me, well, why did you want to write a book about Bill Cosby? Well, uh, like Bill Cosby, I started out as a child. <laughs> and uh, actually, it was, when not, it was when I was nine years old that my mother uh, brought home uh, at least my first Bill Cosby album. Uh, it was called Wonderfulness. Uh, and I come from an interracial family. Uh, my dad, uh, who's passed away now, uh, was black. My mother is white. She's still living. Uh, and uh, they had split up three years earlier when I was six. And we were living in Los Angeles. And uh, my mother had taken my younger brother and me uh, back to the East Coast, and we settled in this little town in Massachusetts uh, where she got a job teaching college, uh, where there were no people of color. Um, and my dad kind of dropped out of our lives. We didn't hear much from him. So all of a sudden, here was this handsome young black man about my, my dad's age, joyously riding a go-kart on the cover of the album, telling these hilarious stories about having his tonsils out uh, and smearing the kitchen floor with jello to keep the chicken heart monster away. And like so many people of that era in the 60s who heard his comedy albums, I just thought they were hilarious. I mean, I laughed until I cried. But I also think, and I wasn't particularly, I wasn't completely aware of this at the time, but I think now when I look back at, on it, here was also, you know, a black male figure that I could identify with. And then I found out that he also was starring on I Spy, and despite the fact that it was on at 10 o'clock and that was past my bedtime, I begged my mother to watch. And you know, there he was, a completely different character, this cool, you know, spy, um, uh, you know, sort of mysterious and, and so forth. Um, so at that point in my life, Bill Cosby was quite personally meaningful to me. And then 20 years later, 
uh, in the 80s, I was just getting married and starting a family when The Cosby Show came on the air. And my wife and I loved the show, um, uh, thought it was, was very, very funny, but also it was kind of a model for what, you know, the kind of family we wanted to have. So I had very, I had personal reasons for being uh, interested in, in Bill Cosby. But as a journalist, I was also fascinated uh, by him um, as sort of a, a, a figure in our cultural and social history. Not only as a pioneer, somebody who opened doors again and again, really the first comedian to not be labeled just a Negro comedian, the first star of uh, African American star of primetime television, pioneer of, um, of children's television uh, with his early guest appearances on Sesame Street and The Electric Company and then Fat Albert. Um, the, the, the most successful, if you all remember, advertising pitch man in the country in the, uh, in the 70s and 80s with, gel, with his Jell-O ads and Coca-Cola and Ford and so forth. And that was all even before the Cosby Show. Um, but then, as you all know, in the last, after a career where he did not bring race and politics into his comedy, and often was criticized for that. In the last 10 years, he's become very outspoken, very controversial for some very strong stances he's taken about trends in the black community that he sees as, as destructive. Um, so I, I really wanted to know, you know, <laughs> where did this come from? Um, and were a lot of the views that he's been expressing recently views that he's had all along, um, you know, sort of what drove him uh, and what was his vision of the kind of social impact um, that he was going to have. Um, plus, nobody had done it. I mean, he's, he was rare uh, in a figure of, of his significance and prominence and that nobody had really written a, a, a serious in-depth biography. So I decided I, I, I wanted to do it. And then I discovered why nobody had written <laughs> A, uh, an in-depth biography. Uh, I, had, um, I had met him a, a few times. I didn't know him well, uh, but uh, sort of in, to sort of greet him when he appeared on the television networks that I worked for. Um, but I did know Alvin Poussaint, who is a uh, Harvard psychiatrist who was an advisor on The Cosby Show and is a good friend of uh, Bill and Camille Cosby's. So uh, I called him and I made my pitch for why I thought Bill Cosby would be a great subject for a book. And he agreed with me and he offered to speak to Cosby on my behalf. A week later, he called back and said, uh, I don't think he's going to help you. He has trust issues. Um, then I got a call from his lawyer telling me, we understand that you're working on a book. Um, fine, we're not going to try to stop you, but just know that you're not going to get any cooperation. Anyway, I decided to go ahead anyway, um, sort of, um, and uh, started, as reporters are trained to do, reporting around the subject when you can't get to them directly, um, talking to people who would, who would uh, talk to me and be interviewed, doing a lot of research. And every once in a while, I would reach out to uh, Cosby's publicist just to tell him that I was still working away. And about a, after a year of reporting on my own, I started getting these emails from Cosby's publicist saying that there were things that, he calls him Mr. C, Mr. C wanted me to be aware of, articles that had been written and so forth. Well, of course, because I had been working on it for, for a year, I had read all of those, and I reported that back. So I don't know whether they were testing me to see whether I was doing my homework, but um, then um, I, uh, after a few months of that, I got another call from the lawyer who said, Mr. Cosby wants to speak with you. And I said, is it good? Is it bad? He said, well, I'm not going to speak for him, but uh, he's going to be in touch with you. He's on the road performing. Uh,